three, two, one. Good evening. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami. Tonight we have the pleasure of having John Matheny from, uh, I think he originally from Baltimore and now he's living in Florida. Uh, he's the uh, possessor of the, uh, or the, the uh, prosthetic user of the innovative robotic arm and he's going to tell us all about that. And we also have Gene Ostrowski. Uh, first, we'll start off with Gene introducing himself. Hello, Gene. Hi, uh, hi, John. Thanks uh, for being here. I'm Gene Ostrowski. I'm the managing editor of MedGadget. And Johnny, uh, welcome to you. And uh, hope we have a, a great discussion. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and, and before before you start, Johnny, uh, I want to tell the audience that you have the option to ask questions uh, at the appropriate time at the end uh, after Johnny gets done talking about. Uh, uh, his innovative uh, prosthetic. Good evening, Johnny. Good evening. Okay, well, why don't we start, Johnny, by 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 going back to your original injury and the kind of way, uh, what you had done originally, and, the, and I imagine you tr tried to uh, uh, tried to uh, use other prosthetic devices. Uh, why don't we start there before we go into your innovative DARPA robotic device? All right. Well, my journey began in 2005. I was diagnosed with cancer. It was called fibrosarcoma. I was only the fourth person in the United States or the world to have that, that particular cancer. So they did six surgeries trying to cut the cancer out and 39 radiation treatments trying to burn the cancer out. And it was a very aggressive and stubborn cancer. It, it was, and just fast. It kept climbing my arm, you know, just faster and faster. So in 2008, after all the things that they'd done, they said the only thing that they have in today's uh, modern technology that they're going to have to amputate my arm and try to get above the last place, last place that they had seen the cancer, and I uh, hope it didn't get into my trunk because if it did, I would have three to maybe a maximum of six months to live. So in 2008, they amputated my arm, and I started uh, going in and wearing prosthetics, just regular prosthetics, and body powered elbow and uh, myoelectric wrist and uh, hook. And during that during that time, uh, my prosthetist was telling me that he had different uh, patients that he is doing studies for different companies on different things. And so I told him, you know, this sounds like something I'd want to do because, you know, I'll, I want to pay forward because, you know, I've got a second chance on life. And so he said, well, he'd, he'd try to find something for me. Uh, not, to be, he, not to be in any hurry to see a result because uh, I was, uh, from what he he seen on me, I was a very unique person and he wanted to get something special. So it took him a little over a year before they finally found something. And at that time, he gave me a paper that had Dr. Albert Chi from Johns Hopkins Hospital's name and phone number on it. And he told me that they were getting ready to start up a targeted muscle renovation uh, program. And they were looking for their first patient. So I jumped. I told him that sounded great. And so I took it and told him, uh, he said that, you know, that uh, he did his job. And all I got, he said, it's all up to me as to where we go from there. So I said, okay. So I, I went home, jumped on the computer, started studying everything that I could find out about targeted muscle renovation. And then about well, about a week later, I called Dr. Chi up, and he he was waiting on my waiting on my phone call. And so he told me he needed to come in and, and do a uh, evaluation on me, both uh, health and mental and all of this kind of stuff, to see if I would be you know. Uh, the type of person they were looking for. I went in and they did their all their stuff and he was went through his talk and all this and then he, he asked me, he said, uh, uh, says this sounds sounds something like you, you're wanting to do. And I said, Yeah. He said, well, I want you to go home, talk it over with your wife for a couple of weeks and then, you know, call me up and let me know one way or the other whether this is something that you'd like or something you wouldn't like. So I got up out of my chair, turned around, sat back down, and looked at him. I said, "All right, when we get, when we go start the surgery." And he was like, uh, well, "You?" I said, I, "From the day that you know my prosthetist gave me the information, I said I went and studied about it. 
had two questions. You answered the two questions. I said, we've already discussed it. You know, this sounds like something I'm, I, that, that I'm willing to do, I'm ready to do. It's something I can help pay forward. So in 2011, October 2011, is when I had the TMR surgery. Done. And by doing that, uh, we was able to start controlling the hand, the wrist, the elbow uh, by thought. But we was having to do it by direct control, which means that any time that you would go from from going like the hand to the wrist, you would have to have some kind of a switch to switch it from one to the other. In my case, it was a, a double flex, both bicep, tricep at the same time. And then you would, you know, if you're going to do it from the wrist to the to the elbow, you'd have to do the same thing, and then better back to the hand to do, do it again. But you know that it was it was good to be able to work. You know the each thing by thought, but you know it's not natural to have to sit there and you know just you know keep trying to choose where you want to be at. So there was a uh, uh, guy's in the military and, and he was in college and his thesis was doing pattern rec system. Pattern rec it takes your brain thought and feeds it down, feeds the information down into the prosthetics. Just like you do with your natural limb, there's no having to choose where you want to do it. It's just you know whatever you decide, whatever you're thinking about doing, whether it be close the hand, open hand, uh, supinate or pronate the wrist, or extend or bend the elbow. You know it's it's all just natural. It's just no you know clicking between where you want to go. So we worked with that, and once we got that started and all and all that, then we got in uh, in touch with. The uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. The, they had gotten a $120 million grant from the Department of Defense to build a robotic arm. And the robotic arm was supposed to do, do two purposes. It was supposed to help a robot that they was using in the field to help disarm uh, roadside bombs and things along this line so it, would, so it wouldn't be such rough on the, on the personnel themselves. And the robotic arm was then in turn to be able to use on human subjects in order to be able to work just like your natural arm so that, you know, if you did lose your arm in, in battle or whatever, you know, that you would have an arm to be able to work with. And so they, they decided, you know, they got it with the robotic arm and they proved that, that it was, you know, it was very worthy for that. So they were not only using it in the military field, they also have police departments that uses this robot now to... Uh, help defuse situations. Uh, so they they were ready to start on the on the human side of it. So that's where I come in at. Since I already had the targeted muscle renovation, they wanted me to come in and try it out to see if we we would be able to use it uh, humanly. And so we started out with it in 2000, early 2012, late 2011, early 2012. We had miles of wire coming off of it. Individual stickers that you know stuck to my stump with wires coming off of it, going to a computer where it was reading everything that I was I was doing, and then sending a signal back to the arm and telling the arm you know what I was thinking about, I wanted to do. And once we got all of that worked in and started out, then it was uh, just a little ways in 2012 we went to Wi-Fi. And then we had a suction. We put it on, on the suction part that goes on your stump. They would put it on the inner sleeve on the different different areas. And then we would be able to, I'd be able to work the arm from there. Uh, I'd already set up my pattern for me with the computer. So all I had to do then now was for about, at that time, it took about six, six to eight minutes. I would train the arm my thoughts. Then all the computer would do would set back and you know it would just it would just watch the watch the signals and you know check to make sure that the arm was doing exactly what what I was asking it to do. So then we get into 2000, late 2014. We go in and uh, there was a new company come out with mile bands, which they originally brought out to use whenever you go in and, and do talks. You use it rather than uh, using your computer and all this kind of stuff to change screens, or you can do it like this and, and use it for a laser and you know be able to point things out. So the uh, head tech uh, down at the Applied Physics Lab, 
figured that he'd use that for that, so he got the toes off of them on being able to get into it. So we use the mile band now to put on my stump, and via Bluetooth technology now, we can I can send the signals from my stump into the computer and work the arm just like just like it would, you know, it was part of me now. So far, it's been in the lab. We've not been able to get it out of the lab because all the money that the Department of Defense put into it for them to build and, and do all this with has run out. And we're trying to raise money to be able to get it to where I can bring it home and we can do home studies with it. But, uh, you know, that's we haven't got there yet. We're still working on that part of it. But different things that, you know, that, that you can do with it, you know, the, the MPL, it's a uh, multiple purpose slim. It can be just a hand if you just lost a hand, hand and wrist, any given part of the, el the forearm up to the elbow, all the way up to the complete shoulder, shoulder or tip. This is this is you know it can be it can be used in any portion. And it was uh, it was all set up because before me it was all set up under the traditional measures, suction and straps and all this kind of stuff. And then I broke them into the world of osseo integration. Which is a metal implant, a titanium implant that goes right directly into your bone and protrudes right out the end of your end of your stump. And now you can just connect to the implant, and there's no suction, there's no straps, nothing. It just it's just all here. And via the the arm bands, then you know you you're still able to talk to the to the arm and get it to do what what I'm looking to have it do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guess we're going to ask a few questions. Go ahead, Gene. Why don't you uh, start it off? Can you, oh, Gene, you're muted. Yeah, microphone. All right. I think I got it now. Yeah, Johnny, can you tell us what, what does it feel like and how much can you lift with the hand? Uh, and just tell us about what the experience is like compared to uh, previous arms that you used before. Okay. The the MPL is a is a very unique arm. You can you can reach down and pick up 200 pounds 200 pounds off the off the ground, pick it up and walk off with it. Wow. Or you can curl uh, 50 pounds with it. Wow. Okay. Oh, wow. Now I've had my surgery. My surgery is only going in seven months, and you know it usually takes you about a year to completely heal. So what we're doing right now is you know we're taking it light. Uh, I've uh, I've adapted a weight to my implant, which is this right here. Okay. And it, what it weighs six point six pounds. This is this is what the the MPO weighs. Okay. Six point six pounds. So we'll, go us how how you use it. And so what I do is uh, I take this and connect it to the end of my stump. Tighten it up, and this way, you know, I can, I'm able to work it mm -hmm. and all this to uh, build up strength in my shoulder, and also by doing by putting weight on it, also helps promote um, bone growth. It builds builds newer, newer and stronger bone. Mm -hmm. So far, with the arm, I haven't pushed it past 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. but like I say, I'm just a little over six months into healing, so. Mm -hmm. Takes time. So, so this is this is where I'm at now. Okay. Can can you tell us about the TMR surgery? What does that involve? And uh, okay. T the targeted muscle TMR surgery. What it does is all the all the information that goes past the end of your arm that runs runs down all the way into the end of your fingers. All the information's here. It's just there's no place to go. So what what TMR does? It takes different muscles within within your stump, like one of your bicep heads, two of your tricep heads, uh, and a couple other muscles in here. They'll take out the uh, natural nerve ending that, that's in it from the beginning, and then they'll implant a nerve ending that would work the, uh, the lower part of the arm. Mm -hmm. And then this way, as you uh, think about, you know, at the beginning, because, you know, once you have an amputation, it doesn't take too too long after the brain sends information and doesn't get no result. It shuts it down. Mm -hmm. okay. And once you open the pathways back up, it begins all over again in a learning process. 
So you're just like, you know, a young baby. You know, you're just barely able to, to work hands and all this. And then, you know, as you progress with your different things, you know, rotating the wrist and all this kind of stuff, then you start progressing. And, and you're at the beginning, you got to think about every mover pretty much, you know, you got to concentrate on doing it. But then the more you do it, the less you got to concentrate. And I'm getting to the point now where the movement is just as natural as, as what you do with your regular length. Okay, so you expect that eventually it will be natural, that it will be totally intuitive and you don't really think correct. about it. Correct. Well, you don't... And, and as... Go ahead. And such as, you know, uh, if you want... If you're talking about, you know, you want to you bend your elbow. Right. I know the, the main... One of your bicep heads is, is the one that bends your elbow. This is this is one that they do they have not done anything with. So whenever you do something, you know you can see the muscle pop up here mm -hmm. to where you're bending the elbow. Now, when you go to close your hand, this is one that they've reinverted in the other bicep head, which is down here. And so whenever you go to go to close your hand, you'll see just this muscle moves versus when you try to do the bend the elbow. Okay. So uh, I'm, try I'm having a hard time understanding. Let's start at the very beginning. You have a thought. You want to, say, bend your elbow. Now, how does does the computer learn what your thoughts are, or, or do you teach a computer? Uh, yeah, it's like a like a how like does a, that work? It's really it's really like a, a EKG. EMG. I can't yeah, yeah, remember which one it is. True. It reads, it reads your reads the you know, the nerve endings in your skin. Oh, okay. So there's a certain EMG pattern that that conforms to elbow flexion? Right. As uh -huh. you're sending as you're sending the signal down, then it comes down and of course, you know, that, that particular muscle, which would be one of the bicep heads, that's the one that flexes up, which creates the the uh, impulse for the the band to read to send to the computer in the arm that I want the elbow to. Okay. And the same thing with you know with your hand closed and back here is elbow straightened and hand open and I can't remember on which side the uh, you got wrist rotation uh, you got uh, individual I, I'm now able to do individual finger movements. Wow. Okay. You can do things like a, a single pinch. You can do a chuck grip. You can do a cylindrical grip. You can do it. Grasp. You can do a point this way. Uh, you can do point. Let's see, point that way. Then you can do like a uh, for a credit card. Put a credit card into a slot. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, by anything that, that you know that your anything that your hand can do, the MPL can do. And I am there. In my particular case, there's 17 degrees of freedom. And at the last that I was in there, I was able to work with the MPL on a two-week straight basis. I had got myself up to 14 of the 17 degrees of freedom. Wow. Now, if, I, if I'm able to bring this thing home and do studies, you know, I'm probably reached the full 17 degrees of freedom. Does the hand have sens haptic sensibility? Do you ha can you experience sensation and touch? Okay, that's another thing with me. When they did my TMR surgery, all they all they told me is, is since I was the first, all they was going after was motor control. Oh, okay. And so but they, your body is so resilient. Once it's once it sees, you know, you're getting back some of your natural ability. It, it can't stop there. It's hunger. It's hungry for more. Really? So next thing you know, it starts growing its own sensations. Wow. The first thing that grew in for me was my, my little finger. And the second thing that grew in for me was my pointy finger. And so uh, just to prove that this wasn't a fluke, uh, what they did with the MPL is they put in uh, vibrating tactics over my little finger, my pointer finger area that's in here, my little finger here, my pointer finger here. And uh, they put heads, headsets on me, playing playing loud music, blindfold on me, and they put me through a series of tests mm -hmm. where they would actually, you know, be a, like wiggling wiggling my fingers, right? And I'd be telling them which one that they was messing with. Then I would get a, they would have a, a softball and a hardball down there, and they would put it in my hand, and I would close my hand, and I could tell you the difference between a hardball and a softball. Wow! Just with, 
just with those sensations. Wow. Okay. Now, since that, all the rest of my digits has, has grown in. I've got sensation with all of them here. And all we got to do now is, is pick it up from here, which is what APL is doing now. They're, they're working on a system to add to the myoband to where I'll be able to have sensation, you know, back into my hand. So this way, you know, I could tell uh, how, how much when I, whenever I shake somebody's hand, I knew how hard to shake a hand. So I have shaken probably uh, over a thousand hands with, with, the, with the robotic hand. And I know just, you know, I can reach down and shake a young child's hand. I reach up and, and get John's hand. You know, he's a big old burly boy, and he wants a good manly handshake. I can reach up there and you know, let him know that he's got to hold the good hand. <laughs> and you know, it's but this arm is so unique. It's it's able to reach down and, and shake a child's hand, then turn around and jerk a car door off, to save somebody's life. Wow. Well, it's an, it's incredible. Uh, how many how many of these arms have they made? You know. I think right now it's either 12 or 14 arms they have right now, okay. and they've got you know some in different uh, study or different uh, study hospitals, you know, in the United States, as well as you know in the APL lab. Uh, they've got uh, two that they use on the robot that they have in the lab. They take out and use demos for. And what's unique about this is. Is like the robot. Say it was it was out uh, controlling a crowd or something, and somebody somebody knocked one of the arms off of it. But they could still you know they still needed to use it. Well, if I was standing over, they come over and they say, "Here, John, let me borrow your arm." I take my arm off. They connect it to the robot. It goes back out there and finishes control, controlling the crowd. It comes back. They take it off of it, put it back on me, and I go down their way. <laughs> Same arm. Hmm. What about the power, the electricity, the battery? Where is that? Uh, right now, they haven't done too much on the batteries. Right now, all they've got is a stack. I think it's six, uh, six like watch batteries stacked together, and that's basically what controls what controls the arm right now. And it it usually lasts any depending on how much I use it. I can go maybe four hours with it before that I have to. Pop that battery out, pop a new one in, and keep on going. Mm -hmm. But once once we get the money to be able to get a, get one to take it home, then what they'll do is you know then they'll sink the money also into getting a battery that's going to going to hold up and all this kind of stuff to where you'll be able to use it use it all day or practically all day before you have to. Wouldn't that be a, wouldn't that be a bigger battery you kept carry around maybe as a backpack or something like no, that? No, no, no. You've seen all the all the batteries they got out now. You know, it's just. They can, they can make a, a real long-lasting battery in a small pack. Okay. So, you know, I, I don't know whether you've seen uh, flex cell batteries. Have you ever seen flex cell batteries? No. I never have. I mean, it's just paper thin, but this is, you know, it's, it's paper thin. It's uh, about that wide, and they'll go anywhere between this long to maybe that long. Mm. And it's got as much power as, uh, uh, what's these, lithium batteries. Mm-hmm, okay. Got as much power as a lithium battery, and I mean they, they weigh you know practically nothing. Almost a feather almost weighs more than they do. John, do you enjoy your sessions at the lab? Oh yes, I enjoy the sessions very much. You, you look forward to them. Oh yes, every time I go in and I get to work with that arm, man, it's you know, it's exciting. Really? So yeah. can you describe a typical day when you go to the lab? Uh, go into the lab. The first thing we do, you know, we get the niceties out of the way, and then. We connect the arm up, and they tell me to, you know, move the arm around a little bit to be able to get, you know, the shoulders and, and stuff ready for it. And then we'll go into a training session, which we can go through the six basic maneuvers in less than three minutes mm -hmm. and train the arm. And then, you know, I can I can work the arm. I can do a do a do a hand close, hand open. I can do a supinate, a pronate on the wrist. Extend and bend the elbow. That's your that's your six basic moves. After that, we go through that a few times. We'll do you know basic things like pick up balls or you know pick up a, a bottle of water and this that and the other to you know to make sure that I'm, I'm me and the arm is synced. We're you know we're we're we're, all, we're one. Once we do that, then we'll go back in and we'll start adding information such as you know we'll do points and we'll do pinches. And then we do the individual finger movements, 
and then this way you'll be able to work all this at one time. You know, you just you just whatever you're whatever you know you decide you want to do. You want to sit there and you, know, you just want to play with the fingers. Because you know, eventually one of these days I'm going to try to get a piano, which I can't play with my with my regular hand. I'm going to try to get down there and play with with the robotic arm. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to put the picture on the screen there so people can see it. Hold on, let me let me let me make sure you guys can see it here. Hold on. You just uh, the... Okay, there we go. Okay, you should be able to see the picture of the arm there. Yeah. As you can you can see there, what I've done is they've had a uh, checker on the table, and I have taken the arm down with with the the pinch grip, went down and, and grabbed the checker and picked it up and hold it up, and then I'll take okay. it over and I can you know. So they're really concerned with fine movement, fine, fine. Yes, and with this, with this, this is this is a hard one to do because right now the way this hand, particular hand, is set up, we don't, they don't have the uh, finger. It's a, a rubber-like type finger tip that we can put on them that feels more like your natural finger. This okay. one's just the hard plastic, so it's it's hard to do the pickup. Mm -hmm. And with this one, I don't think this one has the fingernails on it. They also have fingernails. It's like your regular natural fingernails, you know, can help you hold things, you know, like picking up uh, uh, a clip, you know, a paper clip or something off the table. You know, you can pick it up and put it in your hand and, and you know, grab a hold of stuff. Well, but, I, I can see the wrist here. It's like a rotation type of wrist, right? Yeah. Now, this type of this wrist right here has, uh, I guess you'd say, four degrees. It has... You can bend your wrist down this way, bend your wrist back this way, and of course you can uh, supinate and pronate with it. Now they they've got one one wrist that's even even more advanced than that. Then you can rotate your wrist back and forth this way as well as going this way and that way, and this way and that way. So it's got all the natural movement of your natural wrist. This one they've got set up just to, just as a two way one. Because you know most of the times when you reach down to pick up something, you're bending your down. Or if you go up to reach to get something, you're up like this. So. You know, you know, obviously the, the the motion that's very important is the apposition of the index finger and your thumb, like like you're doing with that. Right. Now, what other types of motions do you have that you really think are important beside the finger, index finger, and the thumb? What other motions do you consider very important that this arm can do? Uh, besides, you know, the, the full ability to grip, which I guess you could, you could get by with, with just gripping with this for the majority of things, but, you know, you get into uh, a lot of cylindrical uh, patterns that, you know, that, are, that you know, it's, it's cylindrical and, and round at the same time. That's where the rest of them comes in, so you get a, a nice, you know, cylindrical grip to be able to get, get to everything. Such as, you know, if you, if you pick up a bottle or something, you know, you want to pick it up and then you want to put your finger underneath it so the bottle doesn't try to slip down through through your fingers, you know, if it, it would be like, you know, in a, in a slick position, had a little something on it. But I think these three these three digits right here is probably, probably your main ones. Okay. These two fingers and your thumb. How about those? Ba I think you mentioned the bands before. The purpose of the bands are just to strengthen the, the tascrin, or what? what are no, the no, those bands on my stump. Those are the ones you see the black on the outside. Well, it's got the metal on the inside that's reading the signals coming off my arm to send the send down to the to the arm. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, by the way, I wanted to let the audience know if anybody has a question uh, right now. Uh, there's a Q&A button on the left side. You should have of the uh, of the Hangout window, and uh, we'll be happy to let uh, uh, Johnny uh, have the opportunity to answer the, those questions. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Johnny, was are they was there any talk about uh, adding any kind of superpowers? Like, for example, like I was thinking, like. Uh, uh, you know, you can have uh, with a robotic arm, you can have like uh, the ability to continuously rotate a screwdriver, right? Uh, right. Yes. Uh, now they can set that arm up to where you can do that. Matter of fact, most bionic arms that are out on the market right now, that's what they do. Their their wrist will go around, 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 around. So you can all you got to do is hold a screwdriver in your hand. You can screw in, screw out, or a wrench. You know, until it tightens up or loosens up. That's that's the way it is. 
-hmm. But with the robotic arm, they have a set up so it's just it's as natural as yours. It only has the it, it goes to the degrees that your arms your hands does, and that's mm -hmm. where it stops. Oh, okay. So they do really try to replicate the the their natural abilities and not try to extend those. Right. I see. Okay. Well, well, you know, I wasn't familiar, Johnny, that you couldn't take the arm home. Uh, maybe it was naive on my part, but I guess the government puts so much money into developing this, and they're continuing to develop, they won't let it leave the lab. Well, it must be very expensive arm, I'm guessing. Yeah. yeah. How, yeah. how much money would you, you say, Johnny, they spent on developing this arm? It was $120 million is what they sunk, sunk into the... Uh, uh, Arms. I had this. You know, I think I think it was split between the MPL and the Deca arm. Right. Okay. One hundred twenty million dollars. When do you? What? Is, and they give me a time frame as to when you might possibly be taking home some type of uh, prototype of, of of that arm. Uh, right now I can't give that because you know the thing is we've got to we've got to raise. Uh, uh, enough money in order to be able to do that, and I think the you know probably the minimum that they'd be looking at somewhere between five hundred thousand to a million dollars per arm. Per arm, okay. Per arm, yeah. okay. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to raise enough money for myself and another uh, person that that is working with the MPL, and he is double shoulder artillery, and he's able to work both arms, both robotic arms. With his mind. Okay. Yeah, I think I saw that video on YouTube. Uh, you were in that YouTube video with the other gentleman that had a robotic arm. Right. And is he at Hopkins? Are you the only patient at Hopkins now going through training, etc., or is there other patients? Uh, there's been other patients that, that goes into Hopkins and does the training. They also have the arm down. Uh, I don't, can't remember how many arms, uh, whether it's one or three, they have down at uh, Walter Reed that they're, they're letting the, uh, the military uh, work with them and learn, learn the, about the use of them. Okay. Very good. Yeah, more time is innovations. Uh, as, one, as the video that I saw you in talked about how things develop in wartime. And when the government gets behind it, it seems to accelerate the development because it, it brings money into research. Right. So, so when it comes to prosthetic legs, I mean, you know, that right now is, in all actuality, uh, people would be better with a set of prosthetic legs than they are their natural legs. No aches, no pains. Uh, <laughs> you break your knee, you break your ankle. You're not out six weeks. You're, you know, you, you're in the in the lab probably uh, three hours or whatever. All they got, they're getting to the point now. All they got to do is just change out the parts. You're on your way. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, and you stub your toe, you never feel it, you know, all this kind of stuff because, you know, right now there's no sensation. They're starting to work uh, legs now because they've got them, they got them developed so much. They're starting to get new TMR on legs so that uh, they can be able to, uh, you know, feel better, they'll be able to feel with them and, you know, be able to work them better. Hey, do you know the difference between the any differences that uh, are important between the DECA arm and the the APL arm? Okay, the, they're both great arms. Right now, the DECA arm is an arm that you you work with your feet. Uh, each each leg has certain functions that works the arm. And then uh, you know you can you can control. How fast or how slow that you want to use it. Uh, you have a switch on your side that you can uh, go. I think it has six different six different type grips on it, and you just you just click the button and it changes you from one grip to the next. And you basically you know with the light that's on your arm, you know which grip that you're in. You know after you use it so many times, you know which grip that you're in, mm -hmm. so that you can you're able to work it. So if you know if you're not looking to you know have surgery to do the TMR and be able to control uh, prosthetic with your with your mind, uh, you know the Deca arm is a, it would be the best be the best, one of the best arms to do. I only draw back to the the Deca arm uh, right now is when you're riding in an automobile you have to shut it down because what it does it 
it works just like your cell phone. You know, as you, as you move your cell phone around, the screen moves. Mm -hmm. And so when when you're driving in a car, you know, if you go like this or like this, right. then it's it's going to start trying to move whatever you know whatever it happens to be that it's set in right there. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the MPL, I mean, you know, it's it's all control with your mind. There's you know, there's no uh, control as far as you know if there's if there's any action. So you know, it doesn't make a difference if you're in a car or you know whatever out walking or whatever. You know, you, it's it's going to be the same. It, it doesn't do anything until basically you tell it what to do. What do you use on a daily basis when you know you don't have the APL on? Say again. What, what do you use on a daily basis when you you know you don't have the AP alarm at home? So well, I'll be getting my first arm since I've had the osteoarthritis surgery probably this week. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason being is uh, I got my osteoarthritis done through specialized surgery, and since I was the first one in the United States to get this. The FDA didn't have anything in intact that well, we could attach to uh, prosthetic arm, hmm. and so we had to work with them about doing this. So I worked with them diligently for six months to see if we could get them to uh, let us hook up to an arm. Hmm. I wasn't looking out just for myself. I want you know I could I could have just you know went and say you know this weren't done for me, but I wanted this done for anybody that had osteoarthritis surgery. In the United States, I wanted to be able. To, they was able to connect to the the implant as well as myself, and so we finally got that worked out uh, in the latter part of December. And so after that, then the uh, prosthetic company that, that I usually work with, uh, they started started building building the arm. And like I say this this next this week here, I'm going up to Baltimore. He's going to meet me there, and we're going to start. Putting it together and attaching it to me. Then. How often do you go to the lab, John? Once a month? Once? A, once no, it's it's anywhere between once to every three to six months. Okay. Uh, and for how long a period of time? It it varies anywhere from uh, one day to as much as uh, four days before I go out and do a demo. And and in between times, they're continuously working on it, improving it, etc., trying to do different things. Yeah, they're they're taking all the information whenever I'm in the lab working with it, and the computer is reading everything that I do and all this. And they're using that information to help, you know, making the the arm uh, better and you know more smoother and all this kind of stuff. So you know, it's more natural. Wow. Because you know, most most people when they think, well, you know, robotic arm, you know, it's like going to be going dun 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 dun. But it ain't. It's going to be just as smooth as, as what mm -hmm. what you do. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, any, any questions before I close, Dean? Uh, no, I guess we, we covered everything. So. Yeah, that was that was great, Johnny. Thanks for taking the time. You, you're a busy guy uh, traveling all over the country and may, maybe the world. Where, where are you going tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow I'll be going to Baltimore, and I'll end up in northern Virginia at DARPA on Wednesday. Okay. And then I'll be back up in uh, Laurel, Maryland at the APL lab, and I'll be doing some stuff in Baltimore. i got to go up there to uh, another uh, company that, that has pattern rec. It's uh, uh, IBT, Infinite Biomedical Technologies. And uh, I've got an arm here that we worked with the original pattern rec system that I have converted over to. It'll connect to this now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, they're going to fix it up to where hopefully they'll be able to fix it up to where I can start wearing it also. So this way I'll have two arms to work with in case one of them goes down okay. until we can get the MPL, which, you know, that one right there is the boss. Okay. I mean, it's the boss of all arms right there. <laughs> Most unique arm in the world. It's the only arm in the world like it. Yeah, right. Well, that's great. Well, we hope to have another hangout with you soon and to find out uh, the improvements that are made. Uh, and uh, thank you for taking the time to come out. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Johnny. Perhaps you can get a demo one day when you're in the lab. Uh, you know, if there's an opportunity, if you can do a hangout. With yeah. The, 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 you know, Johnny, you can ask ask the DARPA people 
uh, if, if there's something they can show us, that would be nice. I think the people would be yeah. interested. I, I, know. I have a, uh, I have a demo next week, Monday week. It's going to be up at John Hopkins Hospital. Uh, while I'm up there this week, I'll talk with them and see if it's possible that maybe we can do a hangout in the hospital itself when we do the demo up there. Yeah, that would be. We've done we've done hangouts with uh, John Hopkins researchers before. You remember Gene? One of the first ones we did was with yes. a John Hopkins yes. researcher. Yes. So yeah, we we would welcome doing a hangout with uh, with people at John Hopkins. That would be great. Okay, well, I'll check out and see what I can find out, and then I'll get back with you and let you know what I found out. Very good, Johnny. Thank you. Hold on, we're gonna end the broadcast here. Thank you very much. Thank